Welcome back to the CES International Press stage. I'm Stephen Graves from Stuff.TV, and I'm joined by Max Lebowski from Formlabs, 3D printing specialists. Max, how's your uh, CES been so far? It's great. Uh, it's, it's, it's been awesome to see how big uh, 3D printing has grown at CES. The, the section is like larger than ever. And can you tell me about some of the things that Formlabs has, uh, has brought to CES 2015? Sure. I, I actually brought some props, so I, I can show you. Um, so, first thing is, um, uh, so in, in stereolithography, in, our, in the type of process that our printer uses, you, the parts are built on these support structures. That, that's these, these things here. And we've uh, uh, just released a, a totally new version of these support structures, which are more minimal, support the part better. Um, so basically, it saves on resin usage and, and prints faster. Um, and th this is something I'm really proud of, because it's, uh, it's actually quite a, a lot of technology that, that goes into um, automatically generating these structures and figuring out where they should go and, and how they should support themselves. So th this is a, it's a pretty big improvement. Um, and along with that, uh, we also released a new uh, thicker layer, uh, layer setting. So we actually are a part like this is now printing more than twice as fast with the new support structures and, and the thicker layer setting. So it's, it's a pretty big improvement. Um, and can you work me through some of these other props? Sure. So uh, this one's really exciting. This is our new flexible resin. And uh, um, you, know, you can have a look at it there. It, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting for people who are prototyping rubber parts or making things like grips for handles. And, um, and wh what's really nice about it is that it, it's actually is printing just as well as uh, uh, you know, showing all the same detail that we get on our other materials, even though it's softer. So, like the treads on those tires, uh, and this collection of rings. And this last thing is our new castable resin. So, uh, you can use this resin. Jewelers use this resin with a process called lost wax casting, where you print the pattern out and then use that to cast a, a final ring in in the precious metal. Um, and I don't know, you probably can't see on the camera, but the detail is also incredibly fine. There's really tiny uh, um, prongs that are used for setting the, uh, the rings here. So with, with these new resins, it, um, it, it's pretty, pretty exciting because we get to take the machine and now use it as a platform to open up new applications and go, you know, and, and let m more people do more things with the, the machine. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the process that you guys use? It's uh, stereolithography is different than the extrusion process used by many uh, 3D printers. So what are some of the advantages of that? Sure. So uh, just quickly, stereolithography uses a, a liquid resin, kind of like a glue, that's hardened by a laser that scans a layer across the surface of the glue and solidifies it. And so uh, because you're using a laser that can have a really fine uh, spot size, you can make really tiny structures like the, the prongs on those rings. And, um, and so, so we, form labs and stereolithography are known for really the finest detail and best surface finish of any, any 3D printer. And um, in, in addition to that, you can also access these different kinds of specialty materials that, uh, that you, can't, uh, do a, you can't do as wide a range of materials on an FDM machine. It seems that at the moment we're in the sort of the, the dot matrix phase of 3D printing, where you have maybe a, a lower resolution printer at home, and if you want to print something more detailed, you go to the, the local print shop. Um, how do you see that evolving? Um, will we see a day when there's a, a high resolution printer in every home, or is it going to evolve slightly differently than that? I, I think that's a, exactly right. That that right now the, the machines that are available on the desktop, whether it's in, at a home or on the desktop of a designer or, an in, or engineer, are generally relatively limited compared to what's available in, in the print shop, in, you know, where people are running much higher end machines. And, and that's a big part of what we're trying to do is take a lot of those capabilities that are available in those higher end machines and bring them to, to a desktop user. So I think we'll continue to see more of those capabilities come to the desktop, definitely. It also feels like 3D printing is uh, building to a Napster moment for the manufacturing industry. By reducing physical objects to data that can then be easily traded, there's the potential for huge disruption to the manufacturing industries. Um, how do you see that developing over the next few years? Will brands be able to protect their IP, for example? Yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting questions that, that 3D 
printing poses uh, uh, about IP and, and what it means when you can send a file instead of an object. Uh, and you know, long term, we may, may see a world that looks like that, where people send, send data instead of objects. But in the near term, what I think, uh, what I think that means is, is more personalization and customization uh, and more designing for a customer base of one or 10 or something like that. And that's, that's sort of more where, where we're working now, where people are making a prototype of a, of a new product or, or a one-off part or, uh, for, for a process like that. It's interesting you mentioned that because it has implications for the, the supply chain across manufacturing as well. I mean, if you no longer need to maintain a warehouse of parts because you can simply send the files to your users, that's going to have huge implications. It's definitely true. Uh, yeah. So what kind of consumers are, are buying your products? Um, is it more for the hobbyist or the, the prosumer or the full-end professional? So we, we call it a prosumer. We call the Form One Plus a prosumer 3D printer, and what that means for us is it it is used by professionals. It gives you professional quality output, uh, but we sell it in kind of a consumer fashion, where this is something that you might just, uh, as a designer engineer, you might see it, see a sample part or something like that, and buy it and get started on it very quickly without a long process of learning how to use it or thinking about exactly what the return on investment or something like that will be. It's just something you can uh, get started with, with very easily. And what do you see as some of the challenges facing uh, widespread adoption of 3D printers? Is it a case of uh, materials or resolution or cost? I think it's a combination of everything. And that, that's why we work on machines, software, and materials, all of them in parallel. And, and there's other parts of the problem that are outside of what we do as well, like how is the content being made, CAD software, and things like that. So I think as all of these, all the parts of the system uh, develop, the, the number of use cases and the, the accessibility of, of these machines is going to increase, and, and the number of users will increase. So. 3D printing is obviously your, your primary interest. Are there any other areas that you're looking at? Or? Uh, I, think, uh, <laughs> I think there's a lot, enough to do in 3D printing that will keep us busy for a while. But you know, I, I think Formlabs is generally interested in, in tools for designers and engineers, uh, making it easier to take ideas from here and put them out there. So what's the most impressive uh, Design that you've seen created on one of your printers. Uh, there's a, in the, especially in the last year, there's been just like a huge outpouring from our customers of, of amazing uh, products and projects that they're working on with our machine. I think we have like counted now 15 different crowdfunded um, projects or companies that have used the Form One in their development. That's really exciting to see because we launched our product on Kickstarter. Um, there's. Uh, one of my favorites is there's, there's an Austrian guy who's uh, printing um, insect models for museums, like large 10 or 50 to 1 models this size out of, out of many parts and painting them and detailing them until they're just incredibly realistic and lifelike. And he does a lot of that with the Form 1 Plus. That sounds incredible. Um, one of the other interesting aspects of 3D printing is we haven't yet seen widespread adoption of materials like ceramics and metals in the home. When do you see that happening? Um, is it a near-term thing, or is it going to be resin and plastic for the time being? It's, it's definitely going to take a little bit of time for that to reach the, the lower-cost desktop machines. Those machines require more power, and, and you know, they, they are more complex, expensive machines. But I think you know, that, that will definitely be a direction that desktop machines will move in. Do you ever think that'll make it into the home, or is that going to be more of a, you know, go down to your local 3D print shop and, and run off an object? It, it's hard to say. Um, you know, we, we'll see where that goes. Okay. Thank you very much for your time, Max, and uh, I look forward to seeing what you, uh, what you have planned. All right. Thank you.